thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to COBUS 2022. Uh, this will be my second time at COBUS. Uh, and I'm sorry that I can't be there in Maribor today um, and that I'm having to deliver this remotely. But I say hi to all of my colleagues uh, who I miss uh, meeting today. So I'm going to talk about uh, resource description and access, RDA, in what I call the fifth information age and focus on three aspects uh, of cataloging in the 21st century, uh, which are entity, identity, and authority. The fifth information age um, is uh, a development um, from the very simple uh, model of S.R. Ranganathan, uh, the founder of modern library science. Ranganathan's model is extremely simple uh, and can be stated in, in the famous rule uh, to every reader their book. That means that uh, each person who wishes to read a book should be able to find the book that they wish to read and then obtain it to read it. However, in the fifth information age in the 21st century, Ranganathan's book has developed into a huge range of content, uh, text, still image, performed music, etc., cetera, uh, embodied in a wide range of carriers, uh, online resource, audio cassette, et cetera. The terms in this uh, diagram are in fact uh, content types and carrier types taken from RDA itself, uh, in turn based on the RDA Onyx framework for resource categorization. So the book, uh, Ranganathan's book is a metaphor for this huge range of content and carriers. The person in the fifth information age in the 21st century uh, no longer just reads the book. In the fifth information age, uh, a person can create the content, edit the content, translate it, perform the content uh, in a performance expression. They can reproduce uh, any manifestation, publish a manifestation distribute uh, these carriers uh, and most importantly for uh, the library profession for cataloging, uh, any person can describe these resources. The fifth information age is the age of the internet of smart devices uh, which can connect immediately to one another uh, and of the semantic web. It is this uh, infrastructure that allows virtually any person living today to uh, interact with the creation uh, and transmission of information uh, so readily and so easily. In the IFLA library reference model, which RDA is an implementation of, um, person, Ranganathan, simple model of person, uh, is represented in a more complex way with uh, five distinct uh, entities. Um, corporate body family are familiar, collective agent is something introduced by the library reference model. Uh, and these are linked semantically and in a machine processable way uh, as subtypes. They form a hierarchy of uh, agents. Uh, and as we go down the hierarchy, the specification of what kind of agent we are dealing with uh, is, is better uh, described and more precise. When we look at the book, however, the uh, long-standing uh, work expression manifestation item aspects 
uh, are what we are dealing with in the library reference model. So these four entities represent aspects of the book uh, of the information resource in Ranganathan's simple model. And they are related in a much more complex way than the agent entities. So they are related with so-called primary relationships, which are specific pairwise to each uh, pair of entities. The An item uh, can have only one associated manifestation. An expression can have only one associated work. This is within the same information resource. But a manifestation can embody multiple expressions, and any expression can be embodied in multiple manifestations. And it's this uh, aspect of the complexity of the model that, in fact, represents um, our cultural heritage. So to complete uh, a fifth information age development of Ranganathan's simple model, um, we can have high level relationships which relate any agent to any of the work expression manifestation uh, and item stack. Uh, the library reference model says the highest level uh, broadest relationship is merely a relationship um, uh, uh, element and that these can be subdivided in a hierarchical way to provide more precise relationships, such as the ones on the previous screen of editor, creator, etc. So Ranganathan's model in the fifth information age becomes this much more complex beast here. A uh, further uh, clarification is that within the library reference model, uh, all of the agents have to be real persons, uh, either a single person uh, acting on their own or two or more persons acting collectively uh, as a collective agent. On the WEMI side of the, the stack, the resource stack, however, manifestation uh, represents the recorded memory aspect of an information resource. It is the carrier. It is the thing which exists. It may be tangible or intangible, and that is online. Uh, but nonetheless, it is what carries cultural uh, and recorded memory. It is what drives our culture. It is the absence or presence of uh, manifestations that determine uh, how we educate people, uh, how social cohesion occurs, uh, and how cultural history is viewed by the population. The local culture itself is represented by the work and expression entities. These are the content entities. Uh, clearly, the content is in initially created by agents who are culturally bound in a specific locality. Uh, they create these works uh, or manipulate them in other ways uh, according to their own cultural boundaries. So if we look at the WEMI stack from this cultural point of view, we see the cultural heritage represented uh, by the book uh, splits into the local culture, which is the work and expressions, the content, and the recorded memory of that local culture, uh, the manifestation. Um, the work and expression and relationship to the manifestation are where Jill Hamilton's dead white men uh, live. 
uh, manifestations by dead white men as opposed to dead white women or any other kind of person uh, are a result of local cultural decisions about the reproduction and distribution of manifestations which carry a non-dead white man culture in the form of works and expressions. These are the classes then that represent the entities that represent Ranganathan's simple model. But what we're actually interested in in, uh, in libraries is specific instances uh, of those classes or individuals. We want to describe specific people, specific manifestations, specific works, specific places, etc. Uh, and we do these, we call these things individuals or instances um, of a, a class. Uh, these are uh, things which are members of a particular class and are defined by the class itself. The class boundary uh, determines the boundary of individual members of the class. And we can broadly divide boundaries into two categories. There are physical boundaries. Uh, manifestation has a physical boundary. Uh, a person has a physical boundary. One person doesn't blur into another one. And specific places and time spans also have uh, boundaries which are basically defined using physical phenomena. Um, uh, they can be measured, in, in other words. And they're absolute. There is general agreement on where one person ends and another person begins, etc. The other category of boundary, however, is cultural. These include the works and expressions I mentioned in the previous diagram and other artifacts, even agents can be determined culturally. So the definition of a family will vary from culture to culture and indeed may vary within a single culture. So these two kinds of boundaries determine uh, whether we are dealing with distinct individuals, specific individuals, uh, or a combination of individuals. Um, outside of the machine processing environment, uh, we need to be able to uh, refer to individuals, to specific uh, members of a class. And to do this, uh, we generally assign a human readable label. And there are two main reasons for doing this. Uh, one is for quick reference. Um, I do not wish to refer to uh, my colleague as the person who wrote these books and worked in a particular place on certain dates and is a member of certain committees, blah, blah. I would rather just refer to them as uh, Helen or Marco or their name. It's much easier. And we also assign labels to distinguish individuals uh, from each other. Um, as we will see, that is very, very uh, cultural dependent. Uh, and what we do to distinguish uh, uh, individual instances of things from each other, um, the actual labels that we assign is very much culturally determined. Labels for individuals um, are strings. Uh, a string is just a sequence of characters, numbers, alphabetic characters, ideographs. Uh, they can even be symbols, um, uh, as with the famous case, uh, case of the artist formerly known as Prince. Um, 
And indeed, they, they, they can be uh, oral symbols. That is, a label can be something that is spoken. And as I said, uh, labels are very much determined by uh, local culture and can be categorized by the kind of agent who assigns the label. So RDA distinguishes uh, three different categories of uh, label strings. There are names and titles. Uh, these are typically assigned uh, by the creators of works, expressions and manifestations. These include authors, I wish to be known on this publication as G. Dunsire and not as Gordon Dunsire, for example. Uh, for manifestations, it could be the publisher. Uh, when I publish in certain journals, um, I have to use a certain form of my name uh, with initials, without initials. It depends on journal. Uh, obviously, my name is also assigned by my parents and nicknames are assigned by uh, my friends uh, and other names are assigned by my enemies, but we won't talk about them. The second, uh, the uh, other phenomenon about uh, names and titles is they tend to be assigned in a very local environment. Um, so the names of, of agents, the names of places, the names of time spans uh, can vary quite widely um, uh, in, in, the, in their vicinity uh, because they are the local environment which names them is highly specific. So we typically get uh, place names uh, which uh, are one thing in the local area but when you look at a national gazetteer or atlas they have a different name the phenomena associated with these labels is that they are uncontrolled and unstructured Access points, on the other hand, are controlled and structured labels. Uh, they are assigned, assigned exclusively by metadata agencies, by catalogers, by authority files, etc. And they are an attempt to uh, provide control and structure uh, two labels so that, for example, they can be collocated in browsing lists uh, and so that there's some form of consistency, completeness and hopefully clarity uh, between different access points within the same system. And the close cousins of access points are identifiers typically assigned by the same metadata agencies. Uh, and again, they are a form of controlled string. Uh, identifiers, however, uh, in the RDA environment are those strings that are intended to be read by machines rather than human beings. And they generally carry no intrinsic meaning. And uh, just a final note to say that international resource identifiers, IRIs or URIs, uh, are not treated as strings in RDA. Uh, the distinction between strings and things is maintained, and an IRI is assumed to be a direct representation of an individual within a, a data environment uh, rather than a label for the individual. It's a technical subtlety. Labels are known in RDA and in the LRM as nomen strings. Uh, a nomen is an entity 
uh, in LRM and RDA. And it's defined as uh, an entity that represents a string. So the string becomes an entity. The string becomes a thing in this technical uh, distinction. And making a string a thing allows the string to be described and related to other nomen strings. This is the basis of authority control. Authority control uh, attempts to provide information on where did the nomen string come from? Who assigned it? Uh, it's important to know who assigned a nomen string because it will tell you whether it's assigned in a controlled environment or an uncontrolled environment. How is the string constructed? Um, a nomen string, which is an access point for a person typically inverts the family name and given name. So the natural order is given name followed by family name in many cultures. It's different in other cultures. Uh, but when it's inverted in an authority file, the family name is used as a collocating element and is rotated to the front. So this manipulation of the string uh, for a person um, uses what's called a string encoding scheme. Uh, this is a, a, a method, uh, a pattern for manipulating uh, strings and combining strings uh, which may, for example, represent the uh, date of birth of a person um, and various other aspects. Uh, and these allows, the string encoding scheme allows the uh, strings to be processed, manipulated and rearranged to create uh, an authoritative string, an access point. Authority control can also assign the script or language to uh, a string. Uh, this can be important in, uh, for example, bilingual uh, environments where no one language takes precedent over another. And authority control uh, allows uh, you to give information about what other labels are assigned to the same entity. Most entities have multiple labels. So, should we use strings or things when we can convert strings into things when they are the labels of, of something? In RDA, you can do uh, both the simple model for assigning an access point to a person is given here. Uh, a person has an access point. I have chosen Scotland's National Bard, as Jill Hamilton said, Robert Burns. And this is a perfectly acceptable statement to, to make, uh, to say that some person uh, has an access point, which is this string. But there's a more complex method of modeling the same data, which uses a thing approach. This model is suitable for authority control. Uh, and in this model, the, uh, the string is, represent is, is replaced by uh, a thing, uh, a nomen, an instance or individual example of a nomen. And this nomen has to have a nomen string. So we've immediately uh, reproduced the simple model and the information it contains. But this approach also allows us to say other things about the nomen, which we can't do with the simple model. We can say who assigned this, uh, this nomen string. In this instance, it's NACO, the Name Authority Cooperative. 
we can say if this uh, this Noman string is the equivalent to any other Noman string. And here we have Robert Burns uh, reproduced in Cyrillic. We can say, where did the Noman come from? Uh, uh, does it belong to a particular scheme? In this instance, this has come from the virtual international authority file. So the more complex model, the thing model of labels or Noman strings, uh, enables authority control in a fairly sophisticated and specific uh, manner. In fact, this is a technical comment, in fact what's going on is the entire statement uh, person has access point nomen uh, has been turned into a thing. Uh, this is not something that needs uh, to be of concern to anybody except system developers uh, and system and data analysts. But technically what's happening here is that Noman is what's called a reification of the statement and it's the reified or thingified statement that we can then make other statements uh, about, such as the scheme of the Noman. This device can be generalized. Um, the reification of the Noman entity uh, comes from the library reference model itself. But this approach can be generalized to provide a model of data provenance. And this is what uh, we've done with RDA. So with data provenance, we wish to say things about metadata. Who made the statement? When was it made? What cataloging rules were used to make this statement? So in the example I'm showing you on the screen, we have a simple statement that says a manifestation has carrier type audio cassette. If I wish to say something about this statement, who, who made this statement, I have to reify it. So I take the entire statement, and in RDA, we call this a metadata work. It's a kind of work. And that means that we can now use the whole of RDA to describe this work. A metadata work can be a single statement like this, or it can be uh, a series of, of statements, which is kind of like similar to a record, what we would traditionally call a record. But if we reify the statement as a metadata work, we can now say things to provide provenance information. We can say who is the creator of this metadata work. Uh, in traditional libraries, it is the cataloger who is a person, a real person, an agent. We can say uh, what rules were used to uh, create this statement. Where does the term audio cassette come from? Uh, why is the property called carrier type, etc.? And we can say that we obtained all of this from the RDA toolkit, which is a manifestation. It's an integrating resource. And finally, we can say, where did we get the value of this statement? Uh, how do we know that the carrier type of this manifestation is audio cassette? And we can say that we found this information in a publisher's catalog and so on and so on. So uh, data provenance can be handled through extending the device of Noman to a general reification device or thingification device. And this then allows the neat trick of applying RDA to describe statements made with RDA. Why is this important? It's important 
because we are in the fifth information age. Any agent can describe any entity. We are well used to trained catalogers describing entities, providing high quality metadata about individuals. Increasingly, we are reliant on publishers providing uh, perhaps lower quality metadata about their publications, which we ingest straight into our catalogs. The volume of uh, carriers and content in the fifth information age is far too large for catalogers to mediate metadata from other sources, including publishers. The problem with publisher metadata is that it's self-interested. It's following a different agenda. And it's not necessarily the agenda of the library itself. And increasingly in the fifth information age with social media, we are having the crowd uh, provide descriptions of entities. Uh, these are generally unstructured, but they take many different forms. Uh, reviews, uh, comments, even saying that you like something or dislike something is providing uh, metadata about your particular view of an information resource. So we have three kinds of agents. Um, needless to say, the crowd isn't necessarily interested in information retrieval uh, or promoting reading or culture or any of these things. It follows its own uh, interests and direction. We can manage these multiple sources using data provenance. This is increasingly an urgent problem. The different sources have different characteristics of their metadata in terms of quality, in terms of focus, in terms of completeness. And it's important to know who said what and why. We can further integrate multiple sources using semantic inferencing, another phenomenon of the fifth information age. We can dumb up, that is broaden, fine-grained statements to a lowest common level. Uh, we can take uh, metadata that only talks about creators, and we can interoperate it with metadata that uses more precise roles, such as uh, editors, translators, etc. The uh, the kind of roles I showed in the first slide. Because of the semantic integrity of RDA and the LRM, both optimized for semantic web applications. Uh, this dumbing up is an automatic process. It, it's not a resource issue and uh, interoperating data using RDA elements and entities uh, should be easier than trying to interoperate data that uses multiple encoding systems. Uh, finally, um, it's possible to retain the original metadata so that it can be reprocessed in the future or indeed reused in the local application that it came from. Uh, but it can be converted in bulk uh, or it can be converted on the fly in any kind of uh, cooperative metadata integration system which uses many metadata sources. So in summary, uh, RDA provides a range of tools for the fifth information age. There is a full set of entity and element hierarchies for a wide range of data granularity. There are the appellation elements for cultural contents. These are the kinds of nomen that I've mentioned, including names, titles, access points, and identifiers. These are all clearly distinguished in RDA. Uh, there is the choice of using nomens or nomen strings. 
uh, using nomens for authority control. There is the self-referential model for data provenance using RDA to describe RDA. And finally, there's an assured level of interoperability in systems which use multiple data sources, which uh, use local choices for how the data is described, the granularity of the description, what particular uh, values are used to describe an information resource, uh, what controlled vocabularies, et cetera and which implementation scenarios uh, uh, the data is intended for. Not all data is intended for linked open data. Uh, some data uses relational database management systems, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the conclusion I have is that RDA provides the tools which are required to manage what's happened to Ranganathan's simple model of many, many, many different agents uh, interacting with many, many different kinds of content and carrier uh, in the fifth information age. So thank you.